Um, so with that cl clarified, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker today. So it's my great uh, pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Justin Jaworski to give this talk. Uh, Justin received his uh, bachelor, master, and PhD degrees all from uh, uh, mechanical engineering from Duke University, where he was also awarded the uh, 2008 Dean's Award for Excellence in Mentoring and supported the research of several undergraduate students with uh, competitive grant awards, such as the uh, North Carolina uh, Space Grant and Sigma Psi Grant uh, in aid. Uh, before joining the mechanical engineering and the uh, mechanics faculty at Lehigh, he held the uh, postdoctoral appointment of NRC Research Associate at the Air Force Research Laboratory and the NSF International Research Fellow at the University of Cambridge. He is an AIAA Associate Fellow and is uh, a recipient of an AFOSR Young Investigator Award 2015 and an NSF Career Award in 2019. Uh, his present uh, his present uh, research efforts include the unstudied nonlinear aeroelastic analysis of uh, flexible structures for next generation aerospace and uh, energy applications, as well as the development of uh, mathematical models to figure out how owls fly so so quietly. Uh, so, Justin, please take it from here. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us today. A great pleasure to be here with you and to be part of this um, IBEM seminar series. <clears throat> I have to thank Si Chong and the Organizing Committee for the opportunity to be with you today and to present some work that we've um, done over the past, say, decade or so on looking at owl flight and how it is um, quiet, how we can understand that and use it for technological benefit. The title is Air Acoustics and Aerodynamics of Quiet Owl Flight, but really the full title should be something along the lines of Air Acoustics and Aerodynamics inspired by the quiet flight of the owl. So this is uh, uh, an informed engineer's take on what are some things about the, um, the owl that make them quieter? How can I understand that from a physical principles point of view and perhaps translate that to something that goes beyond the owl scale to something that is um, so useful at different scales in aerospace, as well as the aerodynamics um, anticipated by changes. And in this talk, I'll talk about wing porosity Elasticity is being means of which you can reduce noise from the edges. Of course, there are other ways to do that. But how that will affect the aerodynamics, which of course comes into play when you start to, um, to judge whether a technology is viable for something that goes on aircraft or technology or not. So now I guess to look for in this in this talk are really a combination of uh, of theory, uh, numerics, and experiments that's been conducted uh, by myself as well as in collaboration with um, folks uh, internationally. Um, to ferret out the physics involved here, and it's been overall a very exciting program. And I'd like to thank NSF that that um, that supported my postdoc, um, as Si Chang mentioned, at the University of Cambridge that started this all, and the continued support through my time at Lehigh um, on these efforts. So I think everyone on the same page. I thought we might start by actually observing the owl. What is it doing, and what can we take away from the owl is doing? Uh, to maybe uh, guide our, our uh, investigations into the physics of what's going on. So first thing, we'll see what Owl is doing to, to hunt its prey. That's where we think it's actually functioning as being solid. So on the right-hand side, you see a great gray owl. This is a very kind of um, classical looking owl with very well-defined facial discs uh, around it. You'll see on the right hand side here, as well as in other slides, um, following these images that are pieces of art. These are actually from John Audubon's Birds of America. At Lehigh, we have one of the uh, approximately 120 um, complete sets of this work that are in the elephant folio form, which were drawn to be life size of uh, versions of these birds, all the birds of, of, in America at that time, that were etched printed, and then um, watercolor artists at the time would then finish each of them off. So each one is his own individual work of art. And just to tie the, the art of, of what we're doing to the science of what we're doing, I've included these also as a reference to what we have in our libraries here. The facial disc functions um, as a hand cup behind the ear for sound. And so the actual bird itself, the owl, was quite small. If you, if you, it's mostly feathers you're seeing that gives it its aerodynamic shape. 
um, but it's really uh, a very small bird inside. And the ear um, is located, if you can see my cursor, is just the sides of the eyes here. So you think of it behaving as sound being cupped that way. On different birds, uh, different owl species, you have different sizes of ear, and as well as the different positioning of the ears that give it a precise um, uh, way to localize sound in the space. So here, if we see um, an owl here, the great gray, um, hearing, say, a vole under the, uh, under the snow, they have quite keen hearing, able to hear beneath the surface. And once it identifies the, uh, the noise as being prey, what it will do is it will move its head about to calibrate its, um, its ears and its vision to, um, to where the sound is. So owls, of course, um, have fixed eyes in their sockets. They can't look up and down as how we can without moving our head. Um, their visual and auditory senses are combined and locked together. And so what this means is that where it's looking, it's hearing, and it does that in a very precise way. So once it identifies the prey, say in this, this sortie it's about to take to go get the, the prey, it never looks away. And, and for this reason, if it's in a nocturnal hunting situation, um, it will hunt where it's very familiar and not knock into things. So once it's found the prey, uh, it will take off and will always be looking toward the prey at all times, because again, it's, that's where it's hearing and it makes course corrections as it goes along. This can be a, a quite a steep path. This is something that's been measured by Kroger et al. in the 70s in a controlled environment, but it may, may vary as you can see here, it's gliding not such a steep angle. You can see it's looking around the trees um, and gliding around them without there being, uh, going on those obstructions without having an issue. And the name of the game is to maintain acoustic stealth, to not scare its prey away until, uh, and, and that means for us about one meter within the target. That's where it's, um, the, the prey is unable to really escape. So you see it's coming down, it's able to hear and, uh, through the snow. Here's your vole. It jumps through the ice. So these really heavy, the heavier birds, such as the great gray, can crash through the ice and then snare its prey. I just point out here, who knows how many takes it took the video crew to get this, but here's the, the prey uh, successful um, take there. Okay, so our, our, our thought is that this is happening um, uh, by being effectively silent to its prey. Okay, and we also know that it's, it's tracking acoustically the, the prey as it's flying through the air. So we put, uh, what does it mean to have silent flight? And we put silent flight in quotations because silent is, silence is relative to something else, or is it relative to a threshold of hearing. So look at this from a broad brush stroke. Um, an owl must not produce any significant noise as it's flying that would interfere with its uh, ability to prey, uh, target its prey. That's the three to six kilohertz range where um, the owl hearing is sensitive. And also alerting its prey, which is the two kilohertz and above um, range up into ultrasound for us. So look at this on a, on a log plot uh, with our hearing. So human range of hearing is this light gray going from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Um, generally speaking, um, for, for, for younger humans. Um, and then you have um, um, this human peak range of hearing is this darker gray um, um, occurring here. If you overlay now the peak sensitivity for owl prey in um, green and beyond this, um, and the peak owl hearing, that's where it hears squeaks and leaves, we're going to identify prey. There's this overlap range, um, the, the critical range where it has to suppress noise. So um, acoustic stealth for, um, for intense purposes is really the two to six kilohertz range where it's reducing all its noise during flight um, to below the threshold of hearing levels and beyond into, um, into ultrasound. And so the interesting part about um, this is that this range also overlaps at the owl scale with our peak um, sensitivity range, the two to four kilohertz um, sound range. So even at the owl scale, if you understand what's happening to reduce noise, there's a possibility of translating that directly to, um, uh, to say, aviation energy um, applications that can reduce noise and also build up their footprint um, for, for use or to enable a noise reduction that can, um, that can rein in, um, uh, uh, they can meet noise standards for, for technologies. So this is, this is the, the, the broad brush view. What happens when I actually measure owl noise? And what's the state of that? 
Um, there are two different camps of looking at uh, owl noise. One is by looking at prepared wings. These are museum specimens. You can put it into a wind tunnel and measure the noise, say with bean forming or an acoustic array. Um, and so here on the left-hand side, this is work that's been conducted by Thomas Geyer at, um, um, at BTU in Germany, as well as with colleagues and a Siraj. Um, and they've done work on, say, tawny owls, barn owls, other types of birds or non-owls species, buzzards, sparrowhawks, pigeons. You can see that they, as you look across the range of um, frequencies, that the owls are below um, um, below the other birds uh, in a meaningful way. These are decibels, so um, 10 decibels for us means about half as loud. So you're going from half as loud, four times as loud, eight times as loud uh, uh, um, um, changes. Look at live birds, what they do is make a micro microphone array, lay it on the ground and fly them over this array. And still you see for comparing a barn owl, which is the most studied owl species, just because it's so common and easy to work with. Um, uh, you compare that against other um, common birds like the common kestrel and the Harris hawk. We see that the sound pressure level that's measured in the microphones um, is, especially as you get to higher frequencies, say one to two kilohertz and above, you see this real large, really large dip in the noise it creates. And here at this point, it goes below the, 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 um, uh, the ability for the microphone to distinguish it from, from background noise. So really into ultrasound, we have this 1.6 kilohertz and above um, suppression of noise that's consistent with what we expect um, from owl stealth. So I just point out that these, these works here are the classical works in terms of the measurements. And these have also been reviewed by uh, an annual review article I published with Nigel Peak uh, a couple of years ago. So the owl wings are domestically quieter than other birds when they're off the bird and when they're on the bird in action. And so um, uh, being an empirical person, um, I also wanted to hear from myself. And since we can't go all together to, um, to go hear these, this is something I did several years ago, just, just as a way to grapple with the problem, I thought I'd play a video that BBC put together um, for your enjoyment to see a comparison of, of owls versus um, non-owl species. The bird's challenge. So for watching critically, we see there are changes in the way that this experiment is done. It's really just a qualitative demonstration of the noises here. Um, some things also to take into mind uh, into consideration are the fact that you have vocalization sounds, you have flapping wing sounds, the rubbing of feathers together as it flaps, um, and how you distinguish that today from gliding, but still you have this difference in noise qualitatively between birds. So if you look at this more carefully in terms of comparisons between owl species and other birds, what is it about owls uh, themselves that are say, consistent on the wings that we might anticipate making them quieter or silent birds? This turns out to be an old problem, um, almost a 90 year old problem in terms of the published literature. So. Um, uh, Graham in 1934 looked at this and said there, there are three owl wing features that are potentially relevant for reducing noise. And these are um, the downy upper surface. This is a, a fine velvety down material that you can find on top of the, the feathers. These are actually, um, you can, if you, if you be with me today, I'll ha pass these around. There's a, uh, this is a, from a great gray owl, one of its primary feathers, its flight feathers. But if you, um, so you stroke the back side, the pressure side of the feather it is a um, kind of a coarse feeling like you have, say, for a duck feather or kind of a typical feather on the back is as a scent, uh, as a feeling like commercial velvet on the back. And so this is one feature that was um, looked at um, by myself and some collaborators at uh, Virginia Tech, as well as uh, Floyd Lank University some years ago, where we looked at this under a microscope, but this actually this exact feather um, uh, and look at the the the, um, the panula or the, um, these fibers that come out of the vein or the, the no penetration surface of the feather. And so if you look at it from um, under a microscope and you look at the moving the focal points, and now you're at the bottom, the impenetrable base layer, which is your vein, and you slowly move the focal point up, you'll see these trunks that, um, that kind of come up from the vein. And then you go, keep going up, 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 uh, about one millimeter off the, the surface, you see these, um, these trunks um, now having um, branches that interlock with other branches or other um, the hooklets of other panula there. And what this does effectively is create a suspended porous layer above the no penetration surface of the feather itself. Right. So 
This is an open area fraction of about 70%. And so this discovery led us to chasing down um, some ways in which we reduce noise by look, just changing the surface itself, which I'll talk about um, later on. But this is just one of the features that was pursued um, in recent years to um, dis discover how that may be uh, uh, helping the owl, but also how it could be uh, an approach to reducing noise without consideration for the owl, just looking at an engineering uh, noise reduction problem itself. Perhaps the most um, obvious feature when you look at owl wings versus other birds' wings is this leading edge comb. And you can see here, even on the artwork, that's pretty well detailed um, uh, for a little screech owl. Here are some images um, taken on other birds. Uh, this is a stiff, evenly spaced um, um, collection of feathers along the leading edge that um, produce a vortex sheet to prevent laminar flow breakdown over the upper surface. Um, there's some work done by the, the, the late Jeffrey Lilly, who in his paper in 1998 asserted that because of the high incidence of the owl wing as, it, as it's coming into um, to land or, or approach prey, that the comb behaves like a series of vortex generators to control separation at low Reynolds numbers. So these owls typically for the Florida barred owl, kind of medium-sized owls are around the Reynolds number, core base Reynolds numbers of 10 to the 5. So you're in that transitional flow regime where um, that might um, behave um, in the way it's stated. There have been some experiments on live owls back in the 70s um, by Kroger and his colleagues, um, where they took um, Florida barred owls, flew them in, uh, in a controlled environment, measured the noise. Then they'd trim off the lean edge comb, and they observed that it was both noisier as well as they didn't fly as well as they did before, um, supporting the argument that there may be both a coupled aerodynamic as well as a an air acoustic um, effect that these um, this this uh, comb has. And other measurements by by Hirsch et al. in, 19, in the nineteen seventies um, on engineered wing uh, leading edge uh, serrations show that indeed noise reductions are possible changing the leading edge uh, geometry. And lastly, there's a trying edge fringe. Um, this is um, a set of flexal filaments at the trailing edge that really are, is formed by the collection of the back edges of the, of the secondary feathers on the wing. So uh, just loosely, you can see this is not a, a hard straight edge like you see on, on typical aircraft. It's rather uh, nondescript. It's a transition from no penetration, no penetration surface of the vein to the, um, the pressure release of the wake. And so, um uh, all uh, flying um structures or, or lifting structures that pass through um uh, through a fluid are generating this noise at the back edge so it's been a bound layer that creates an eddy the eddy interacts with the rear edge and creates noise and so if you get rid of all the other noise sources that are possible say um for a blade passing through the air um this this um triage noise so to speak is um, usually your minimum noise level that establishes your noise floor. So to address any kind of sound flight approach, you have to also address the noise floor, which would be the chilling edge. So for us, looking at this as a problem to uh, look at technologically, it made sense to chase down what is happening at the chilling edge, because that also is a main noise source of things like wind turbine blades and other applications. So work that could be done here could also maybe be translated more directly to, to those. So one thing you do is take all these and put them together, right? Here's a DC-10 that's been outfitted with lean serrations with a fussy upper surface and um, trans serrations. And so this is the future of sonic aircraft. And you know, as aerospace engineers, certainly some of you on, on, on this uh, uh, lecture series are, um, probably not, right? So uh, we laugh at this because, and it's important to realize why we laugh at this, because it'd be ridiculous to fly with this. Uh, there's no way um, any major aircraft manufacturer would, would be okay with it. And so there are design trade-offs that must be uh, that must occur between, say, acoustic stealth or noise reduction, as well as aerodynamic performance, as well as maybe strategies to have them be applied when you need the noise reduction and have them retracted when um, they're not needed. And so for those of you who are, are fans of, uh, of Top Gear series, this is Richard Hammond. And his, this is one of his uh, uh, Miracles of Nature program uh, crank that he, uh, he had several years ago. So um, how can we take this uh, approach, say the trying edge, and model it in a way that we can maybe make predictions about noise reduction and guide experiments for validation as well as experiments for application? 
So again, all wings pass on the air create these uh, these eddies um, um, at a certain flow speed, and this is a predominant source of airplane wing noise, especially on um, on an approach where you have um, the airframe making a, a large amount of the noise since it approaches the, the landing strip. So compared to rigid wings on commercial aircraft, well, we view the owl trying edge as being compliant and porous. These are our assumptions about what's happening at the edge, and we're hoping that our, our research goal is to say, well, if we model these compliant porous properties of the edge, can we see the effect on the acoustic scan of the uh, of the acoustic power? That is the the pressure times velocity, uh, or how we hear the noise its intensity far away from the owl wing. And we anticipate there being a change in the velocity scaling from five to six, um, five being stronger than six because it's actually a factor of Mach number that's knocking it down, as well as a drop in the frequency, uh, uh, the, the, the level as you go from two kilohertz and beyond. And so our approach is to model generation of sound by turbulence um, created by an edge that's either um, non-porous or porous and compliant um, and compare that noise um, as it would be for relative, uh, an ordinary wing. This, of course, stands on the shoulders of giants in this field. Um, and so I'd be remiss about mentioning these three names uh, that really established this field and, and pushed it um, so far in, in the decades after it was, it was started. Um, Sir James Lighthill was the first one to identify um, a compact turbine eddy as being modeled as a quadrupole. So at low speed flows, you can model this as being a point source. And so monopole, of course, is, is omnidirectional. Um, dipole is has the, the, the field shape of being kind of a dumbbell. So that's really modeling, say, a point force or, or a dynamic force on a surface. And a quadrupole is like a four-leaf clover kind of shape. So as you go from monopole, dipole, quadrupole, the radiation strength of each of those gets weaker. So quadrupole is quite a weak source. Uh, on its own, and that came about from White Hill's investigation of jet noise um, as it, and it scales on the so the eighth power of the of the um, of a, a characteristic um, speed of the, of the eddy. So this story changes if you go and put this um, quadrupole or turbulent eddy near um, near a solid boundary. So Fox Williams and Hall, um, using a Green's function approach, um, showed that the aeronic noise, uh, say from a rigid edge scales instead on the fifth power flight velocity. And so what that means, again, power is u to the third times a factor of Mach number. So as you go from u to the eighth to u to the fifth, um, we're going actually knocking down by powers of Mach number, which are smaller than one. And so as you go from eight, seven, six, five, we're going from weak, stronger, stronger, stronger. Um, and that's the way to view these, these exponents. Uh, David Crichton uh, showed in uh, the same year using a different approach, just using the, um, uh, something called the Wiener Hopf uh, technique that I'll talk about in some detail today. Um, that if you have a sufficiently limp point reacting edge, you can actually have uh, a weaker six power flight velocity dependence um, on the sound that's being scattered by the edge. And so um, this Wiener Hopf technique uh, I'll describe in some detail in the coming slides. So how do we take the problem of noise being generated on an airfoil, say on the left-hand side, this is a, a CFT simulation run by Richard Sandberg at Melbourne. Uh, so you have a, 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 a computational flow um, simulation and the shadow graph in the back is showing the, the dilatation of the, the pressure field. You can see it's centered around the, the, the trailing edge where the turbulence is interacting with the edge and creating this sound field. How do we take that and turn it into a model problem we actually can wrap our heads around and use as um, a way to to um, to guide um, for analysis. We do this by saying, well, we have a turbine eddy, any one of these turbine eddies here, and we'll um, we'll presume that as being a point quadrupole source near the edge. That source near the edge um, generates an elastic wave, say if it's a proelastic edge. It also scatters as sound and is heard by an observer or a listener someplace far away. So this is the problem we're, we're going to solve um, today. And um, the way to solve this is not the way it's set up here. There's, um, there's something called a reciprocity theorem that allows you to exchange the observer and the source. And a lot of acoustic problems are much easier to solve that way. And all you do at some later point is to search the subscripts on what's the source and observer when you get to the solution and you have your, your problem solved. So we'll actually be solving the, 
the inverse problem, having said the observer be close to the edge and bombarding with plane waves from far away. And um, the, the work I'll talk about today has been extended in several ways by um, some of the people, uh, people below um, and encouraged to check out their work if you find, um, find uh, this, this problem interesting to yourself as well. Let's look at the plate model. So this is our, our, how we're modeling our poral elastic edge. Um, here we have um, the assumption that we have uh, circular spaced, uh, regular spaced holes of some aperture radius R. And we're assuming a lot of things here to really wash out the effect of the details of the holes themselves. We're assuming that the process, the opening refraction the alpha sub H is small, such that really this is a, a plate equation that has the first correction to for porosity. So if I have alpha sub H be zero, I have just the our familiar beam equation here being forced by a pressure difference across the plate, and this term goes away. So with alpha sub H here, this is just the mass of the, um, of the fluid inside the pores kind of moving up and down. You can see here by the mass times acceleration of the fluid um, in the pores. We're also assuming that the wavelengths of the disturbances, both acoustic and um, uh, structural, are much larger compared to the size of the holes. So the, really the geometry of the holes is being washed out um, uh, and being homogenized in our, our problem. So again, our familiar beam equation, our plate equation that is um, adjusted for having the first correction for porosity. Okay, so these are the equations we have to solve. We've included a couple of different things, but the point is on this slide, although it's a series of math, each one has its own physical um, relevance that's important to, to point out. The first is this phi naught, which is your field. This is a bombarding with plane waves from far away. This is your in your reciprocal problem where you're having your source be far away and near the edge, you see this as being plane waves. Next is our kinematic boundary condition. This is the total, velo total velocity of the fluid. This is the incident field plus the scattered field phi has to match the velocity of the plate um, locally. And so you have the effect of the plate displacement as well as the displacement of the fluid and the pores. This is our plate equation. It's been non-dimensionalized uh, appropriately. Our linear's Bernoulli equation here, showing, connecting our pressure jump to what's happening with the, um, uh, the scattered field. And of course, our Helmholtz equation that governs what happens away from the plate in the scattered field. This is our, our familiar Helmholtz equation. The nice thing about all of this is that it's characterized by two dimensional parameters. And you can, you can reorient to these different ways, but a convenient way to do it is by having one be the frequency-based parameter, our vacuum bending wave Mach number, um, omega, which Again, has all the frequency content into it. And this thing else called the intrinsic fluid parameter, which is frequency independent. And epsilon, actually, for a lot of applications, combinations of structures and fluids, turns out to be um, a small number. So we can use this as an asymptotic uh, way to, to streamline things. And so this depends only on the properties of the fluid and the structure. So take all these equations and we apply things like causality. Um, and we can solve these exactly using some of the Wienerhoff technique. So Wienerhoff technique is a way to solve um, these boundary value problems where you have a, a, a change in boundary value um, occurring at some point location in space. So the best way to describe this is say as um, uh, in terms of half range uh, Fourier transforms. So here we take a Fourier transform and divide it between one region that exists say for negative x region that exists for positive x, and those will become our minus and plus functions. We take the, we apply this to the previous slides equations, and after we, we work all the way down, we actually get to one equation. We, this is called a scalar Van Hoff equation. We have something that's called the kernel. The kernel has all the physics of the problem embedded into case of alpha. We have a minus function, d. We have a plus function, phi prime. I have something on the right-hand side that's not there, a plus or a minus function, and we'll call that L. The key thing here is that D minus and phi prime plus are unknown functions, but we have one equation. Okay, that's the real problem so far, um, is that we have two equations, uh, uh, two unknowns, one equation. That's, that's bad odds any day of the week um, for a math problem. If we look at the kernel function, we have, this is a typical um, for, uh, term you'd have for noise scattering. Everything that involves alpha sub h describes what's happening with porosity. 
everything in term in cyan is describing what's happening in terms of elasticity effects. And you can see now you have waves that are traveling up and down the edge as being a complication by having elasticity built into it. So the name of the game here is to we have we have to resolve this problem of having two unknowns, one equation. We also want to split this into minus and plus functions because we can use some tricks from complex um, analysis to make progress here. This H of alpha also has to be mentioned. This contains the plate boundary conditions. I haven't forgot about those. But those are some that fall out of the analysis that can be embedded into the problem here. So suppose now we can bring all the minus functions to one side, all plus functions to the other side. <clears throat> and within a certain region, the complex plane, um, these functions have to be um, equal to each other. So the equal is called an entire function. An entire function is going to be some kind of polynomial. We don't know what kind of polynomial just yet. So if we look at the behavior, um, this is where we can use um, what's called the Louisville theorem. Um, let's look at the behavior of our, our, um, our Fourier transform variable as it becomes very large. You see that all these terms in these, this equation above um, decay like uh, one over root uh, um, uh, mod uh, alpha or, or faster as alpha goes to infinity. This tells us the, um, the entire function actually is identically zero. So remember how on the previous slide we mentioned we had two unknowns, one equation. So it's by the only continuation in the complex plane that we get to um, a second equation, which is this entire function that allows us to have um, now two equations and two unknowns, and we can now solve our problem. So the, the magic of the Wiener-Hoff analysis is really is by creating this extra equation to solve our problem. And when we get here, we can do the inverse Fourier transforms to find d and, and phi in the, in the proper, proper space. And so you can do that asymptotically, or you can do that numerically, and we've done both in, in the past. So here's our, our solution in its full glory. We have, um, this describes what's happening in the field and the magnitude and directivity are embedded into, um, uh, affected by B, which includes what's happening on the, um, on the boundary and evaluations of the kernel, which again can be done numerically. And so now we invoke um, the reciprocal theorem where we switch the, now the observer and, and the source. So now we have the not noise um, produced um, uh, near the edge that's measured in the far field. And to make this a problem where we're comparing turbulent eddies in free space, as well as turbulent eddies scattering sound from the edge, we define this beta, which is these two derivatives really mean, uh, will mean that we have a, a, a quadruple orient with axes oriented along the X and Y direction. So this is the ratio of the noise produced by uh, turbulent eddy near an edge divided by the sound field magnitude if there are no edge at all. So this is the amplification factor of having the edge there. So far, what we've done is actually to solve an acoustics problem. And so now we have to link this to what's happening with a turbine eddy. And to do this, we will look at um, some properties of the eddy. We'll give it a frequency based on, say, a characteristic velocity and an integral correlation length. We'll define a Mach number. And from that, we'll also get an acoustic wave number. So once the dust settles from this, we can get, in a scaling sense, the acoustic power depends on uh, the, um, the, the characteristic velocity to the third times the Mach number again, which is this low subsonics. This is a small number, say 0.1 or smaller, um, to the fifth. And so these, these powers actually knock down your, um, your, your magnitude of the acoustic power, multiplied by the, these, this amplification factor beta squared. Okay, so if, if, if we have no um, edge at all, beta becomes one, and we get a u to the eighth behavior that we anticipate from Light Hill. Okay, so just from this equation, we can we can anticipate, say, scaling behavior as we look at, at beta in certain ranges. To put some um, some values with this to try it out, um, we looked at some uh, work by Michaela Hare at um, DLR Braunschweig, and so they had some flexible brush experiments. They had looked to reduce the noise by having a flexible and porous or, or edge in some design, and from that we've created um, some effective. Um, values that work with the constraints of our model. Again, this is, these are the uh, aperture um, area uh, fraction and size. 
fluent parameter um, epsilon and the bending wave number, which is our frequency parameter defined here. Now we can compare, say for that, that flexible uh, porous edge, what the noise would be like across frequencies and how that would scale on the, um, the flight velocity. So if we take away maybe one, one slide from this talk, this is, this is the one to, to appreciate. This has a lot of information in it, so I'll walk through it uh, a bit carefully. We have the bending wave Mach number, which is proportional to our square root of frequency. We have the human range of hearing, which is in the uh, two to 20 to um, 20 kilohertz range. We have the low noise owl range of two to six kilohertz, uh, shown in darker gray. And we have, for the different edges, rigid non-porous, rigid porous, elastic non-porous, and poor elastic, we have these different curves here showing in a scaling sense, how the um, exponent will change on the velocity. On the right hand side, we have the actual noise reduction relative to uh, a rigid non porous edge uh, as a function of frequency, again showing the low noise owl, uh, owl range. If you look at the, um, uh, the result for um, the rigid non porous, that's the conventional edge, you can confirm the u to the fifth scaling behavior that we get from Foxman's and Hall. You see on, say, a typical aircraft here, like a 777 or others, um, that is frequency independent. The new result occurs when you look at the other cases, say, rigid porous, which we'll start with, which is the solid black line. So as you go um, at high frequencies, the rigid porous edge behaves just like you would an ordinary um, uh, rigid edge. It has no effective um, change on the, uh, the scaling of the velocity. However, as you go to lower frequencies, actually where the, the model is, is better equipped uh, um, to, uh, to be valid, we see this change in the scaling behavior from u to the fifth to u to the sixth. So u to the sixth is interesting because that's where we know that roughness noise and um, dipole, um, noise, dipole noise from pressure fluctuations on a surface, uh, how that scales on u to the sixth. So in a scaling effect, uh, uh, a scaling view, you have um, no differentiation between there being an edge and not being an edge when you have u to six and above. That's an important um, result in comparison there. If you now go to the elastic edge, so this is the blue edge, um, we see some curious behavior happening at um, higher frequencies, but as you go to the low frequencies, we have this u to the seventh. This is a, a brand new result that had not been seen before um, and also occurs um, between certain frequencies here, this u to the seventh occurs. And then poor elastic, you see kind of a, it's a, a combination of the porous and elastic scaling here. On the right hand side, we see a story where, say, the porous alone has uh, no noise reduction compared to the non porous edge of high frequencies, but has substantial or, or growing noise reduction as you go to low frequencies. And the, the elastic case has these buckets. So they're, they're places where you have uh, minimum noise reduction, but as you go away from that, you have the potential for noise reduction that increases the frequency as well as decreases the frequency that is affected by the porosity value in a meaningful way, say moving the bucket from blue to red. So this is with a particular set of, um, of values of alpha sub H and R and other, other parameters that were based on the michaela hare experiments for, um, for um, chilling edge uh, fringes with uh, elastic elements. Um, and so this is good for if you just pick and choose parameters, but what if we wanted to actually design an experiment or um, a collection of experiments to test whether this model is validated, that can be validated. Um, and the answer, uh, if we can do some kind of analysis to do that is yes. And this gives us parameter guidance for U the fifth, U the sixth, and U the seventh behaviors for the um, non-porous, porous, and uh, elastic edges. So if we go through our result, um, our analysis again, we actually confirm this U the fifth behavior, um, which is a frequency independent result with our greener half analysis that was something done by Crichton and Luckington as well. There's a rigid porous edge, which it turns out to be a, a singular perturbation problem that we can, we can do um, on the, the kernel. And what falls out of this is that, um, that uh, is this effective porosity parameters or dimensionless parameter to governing the whole problem with porous edge. So we'll later see this as being a mu over k, but this is the one porosity parameter, the one dimensionless parameter that governs the whole um, scattering problem. So it's really small, we get um, u to the fifth, which is again at high frequencies. And at, uh, when this is very large or effectively low frequencies, 
um, we get u to the sixth behavior as well as this behavior um, on uh, scaling behavior on the the Frosty um, parameters themselves. So now we have guidance here to design an experiment for um, uh, effectively porous and non-porous edges. And lastly, for the imperturbable elastic edge, we have um, this is based on numerical analysis. Um, we have these bounds based on the um, uh, the the fluid loading parameter epsilon a range where we have this u to the seventh behavior. Okay, more details are in are in the associated work here. There's a real problem with um, trying to validate this analysis um, in that, um, again, the background noise scales on u to six. And so if you're trying to get u to six behavior from the edge noise and, and weaker, you may lose that scaling behavior or that noise um, in the background um, um, flow noise of, 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 your, of your tunnel. And so from a, a mathematical point of view, um, one could view this as ideal, right? There's a new result that came about um, that no one could prove or disprove um, but as engineers trying to uh, make this uh, useful, of course, that's not satisfactory. And so um, um, in giving a, a, a preliminary version of this talk several years ago, um, saying, uh, making this claim, um, uh, someone at, at Penn State pointed out, uh, a fellow named Michael Crane, that um, there's a paper by um, Convey et al. in 1985 that showed that um, you can recover this U the fifth scaling for a non-porous edge using a vortex ring instead. And so um, there's an observation here that um, Combe's work with the vortex ring, as well as work by David Crichton for a line vortex moving around on its um, self-induced motion near an edge, can confirm in, indeed this U to fifth scanning. So it's an analog between vortex sound and the Tillman scattering analyses that we've shown so far. And so the idea was to take the idea, um, take Combe's approach of using um, a vortex ring, which we can generate readily in an experiment and measure the noise scattered off um, uh, an edge. And the beauty of this is that there's no, it's a, it's a quiescent fluid, there's no background flow. And so everything you're measuring is directly due to the vortex ring interacting with the edge. It's a really clever approach to this that gets around the issue of, of um, the signal noise ratio. There's an additional benefit as well, which is that when you do this analysis, you creating effectively a time dependent Green's function for the problem. In, in contrast to what was shown before, we get, um, in addition, a time-dependent acoustic emission. So we'll know what the, the acoustic shape will be like. We get the scanning behaviors, we'll get, and we'll also get directivity um, all in one shot. And so this, um, this gives us more information we can use as, as different tools to validate what we're doing. To show the output of what the analysis can do, on the left-hand side is directivity. So for a, a non-porous edge, we have a cardioid shape. As you go um, up in mu over k, which is our, our dimensional porosity parameter, we go from cardioid to dipolar um, shape. This is accompanied by um, a change in your velocity scaling. Also a change in the minimum distance, uh, the scaling on the minimum distance between the, the vortex path, vortex ring path and the edge itself. And so all these are tied together with the one parameter mu over k. As you change the process parameter, you also see a change in the acoustic waveform that you would get in a pressure signal coming off of this edge. And so we have one, two, three, four different ways to, with, with only one slider, our mirror of a K dimensionless parameter, to test and validate uh, what's happening um, in the experiment against the theory. So really quite exciting for us. And this analysis is, is very recent and came out in the JFM um, just this year. And so we have we've done some plumbing measurements um, with experiment, and we've showed these just to to, to whet your appetite a bit more. Um, again, we're re replicating the the um, change in velocity scaling as a function of the process parameter, and as you go to really low values and on porous edge, you see the cardioid shape, and these um, different points here are representative of uh, an acoustic array around the um, the edge, as well as different vortex ring speeds being fired at the edge. So here we see low scatter. There's also a very um, um, uh, close um, uh, approximation of the cardioid. As good to higher porosity values, this is at the, at the high extreme, we see um, something resembling um, a, a dipole as we expect from the theory, but with a bit more scatter 
And uh, what's happening in between here is also being investigated actively now. So this is looking at the waveform, uh, these scalings, the waveform shape, as well as the offset distance, which is easy to do an experiment because you just change the offset distance manually. So really a, a, a nice way to tie it all together, which is um, um, should be coming out. We're excited about the preliminary work on this. It should be coming out in the next year or so. So we've, we've, we've gone off and talked about acoustics for a long time, but what about the owl? I have to bring it back to that problem. If you look at different owl species, um, you can say compare the uh, the wavelengths per chord of the lowest frequency at which they're starting to um, affect um, or create uh, acoustic stealth. It's so one place that's kilohertz in air, and compare that to their 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 wind chord. This is useful for us because the analysis we did just previously assumes that it's um, several chord length, several wavelengths of sound. Um, uh, compared to the chord, because that would make it um, effectively a, a semi-infinite edge. And when we have um, these uh, a very long wavelength, we essentially have um, uh, what's called acoustic compact edges. And we see, um, if we look at the behaviors of these owls, how they approach their prey, and look at how um, that compares to the wavelengths per chord, we see a, a general division between um, um, owl species. We have the larger owl species, the well-known snowy owl, great gray owl, gray horned, that are um, insolent flyers, and also are have wings that are closely um, non-compact, which is where our analysis before holds water. If you look at the, the smaller species, burrowing all the way down to alpha and pygmy owls, their foraging behavior changes. Instead of using their gliding flight to sneak up on mammalian prey, which um, has um, uh, uh, some sensitivity to noise, um, they're instead um, pouncing or hawking, um, say, insects. And they may be thought of as being non sound flyers, uh, flyers. But again, this has not been proven scientifically because only the great, only a few of these owl species, especially the, the barn owl, have been tested um, um, uh, with with uh, with uh, measurements to see if they're actually indeed quiet flyers. And so there's this division between um, silent, non-silent, possibly flyers, non-compact, um, compact wings. Um, and so there's a hypothesis that can be formed here by saying that, well, perhaps um, the acoustic compactness of the wings for small owls is coming by changes in the diet. Fortune behavior with a silent flight may not be essential. And so maybe the Features that you see on the smaller owls um, may not be uh, useful uh, at reducing noise, but they don't need to be useful because they're not needing, using them. So this is something that has to be um, um, carried out with biologists is, a, is an exciting area of, of, uh, of um, uh, avenue for research in the future for us. So to quickly summarize the air acoustic side of things, um, uh, we've we developed a model to show that aerodynamic noise can scale as if there's no edge at all for similarly chosen parameters. We see that um, uh, the rigid porous edge scales on U to the sixth and the low frequency limit. And for elastic edge, low frequencies, you also have the U to the seventh, which is uh, uh, quite a new result that uh, hasn't been shown in other um, situations before. And you can combine these effects together to show a broad range of noise reduction and some work done with. Um, with uh, William Wolf and Andre Cavalieri have shown this for finite uh, cord uh, poroelastic edges, um, not just um, not just some infinite as it's done here. And we've shown using um, some asymptotic analysis um, how you can identify groups where you get this U the fifth, sixth, and seventh behaviors that you can anticipate with say uh, an experiment or the model. So for owls, implications are this compliant trailing edge contributes likely to the noise reduction by weakening the edge scouting effect, and we speculate. Uh, again, this is one that has to be um, has to be built out um, that the uh, uh, that the the, band, the noise reduction and the fortune behavior are, are are intertwined. And implications for injuring technology are um, we can apply this directly, so we can go drill holes and, and trailing edges all day long. But of course, you don't want to do that without understanding the penalty for aerodynamics um, with that. And so I'll just point down here to the this is going to work here. Um, so if if Sichang, are we okay on time, or uh, do I have a few minutes to go a bit longer? You may, you might be muted. So you really want to keep uh, uh, several minutes for questions. So, okay. Yeah. Um, let let me let me um.
talk very briefly about the aerodynamic side of things and just point some things out and then I'll go to that final slide there and we can stop there if you if that's okay. So there's been some work on the aerodynamic side of things as well, and this is uh, some work done by Regine Hajan, who actually is uh, uh, just started a uh, position at um, uh, UMass Lowell, so he's close to you guys at MIT, and Pete Perdue is even closer, who is an, an instructor at MIT in the mathematics department. So we've actually worked out a way to anticipate for any porosity distribution along the wing, um, the unsafe aerodynamics for that. So I'll, I'll skip through and just point, that, point out that we've developed um, the porous analogs for for Theodorsen, Sears, Wagner, and Kuzin functions, which are classical aerodynamic functions. Um, um, and you can include that now in your porosity um, 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 uh, predictions. And so um, I'll, I'll skip to here, just pointing out the main points of that, which is uh, we've created these um, analogs to classical aerodynamic functions. And um, the details are here in the papers below if you're interested. Um, Peter has made available um, all of these codes online at his GitHub site. And so if you want to go fill with those and make, make your own predictions, you're welcome to do so. Um, and uh, if you're at MIT, you're welcome to go across the hall and, and chat them up. I'm sure you'd be very happy to talk about them as well. And to leave it for where do we go from here? Um, we want to look at, um, we've looked at piecewise continuous, piecewise continuous um, cross distributions coming to for continuous distributions. That's one area to go in. There's also, can we go into aerodynamics of thin and elastic airfoils? We've actually worked on this problem. There's a paper on this um, coming out in JFM uh, very soon with uh, Sonia Tiamkin, who's an excellent postdoc in my group. And then looking at 3D surfaces, um, how can we actually develop surfaces and edges to maybe work together to reduce noise? And for, um, I mentioned before this velvet substance on, uh, on owl feathers, we've taken this and developed what are called finless, these streamless oriented fins um, to actually reduce noise on wind turbine blades by up to 10 decibels over a broad range of frequencies. And the fluid mechanical origins of this reduction is, are under investigation. So again, lots of different areas to push this um, uh, from the physics side as well as the application side. And so with that, I'll thank you very much for your time and be happy to take questions you might have. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Justin, for this very nice talk. So it's uh, like a marriage between the uh, experiment, uh, experiments and the mathematics. So uh, there's a lot of fundamental results using the, this asymptotic analysis and integral equations. I think it's very exciting. So um, with that, uh, like if you have any question, feel free to ask uh, Justin directly, or you can post uh, that in chat and I can read that for you. So. Uh, is there any question from uh, the audience? Uh, so, Ming Tai, you can mute your, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. So, please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi, Professor Jowski. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Xiaopen from uh, Northwestern oh. Polytechnic University. Oh, okay. And a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, I think I have uh, uh, two questions. Two questions. The first one is, uh, uh, if uh, if you go back to your your governing equation on this on the slide, I, I think generally speaking, the your equation is linear, right? Yes, that's right. So you're okay. going back to so, the equation. So so uh, uh, so so uh, if if we we if we consider the 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 the, the uh, porous. Uh, Plus surface as a rough surface, so so can can that introduce more nonlinear effects into the flow, mm. or, or the rough surface can can the rough surface produce uh, some additional eddies, which produce additional noise. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So, um, so this analysis is linear, where you have you suppose you have some source, and it's the interaction between the source, the edge, and the scattering. That is a linear problem. The nonlinear fluid mechanics of how that that eddy is generated is 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 left out of this analysis. But it, it presumes you just take it to the point of going from fluid mechanics. And now you have a source, and then it becomes a linear problem for the acoustics. Um, so something that's that's an important thing. Uh, if you're doing a, a trying to characterize the noise source, you'd have to do a, a, a nonlinear CFD analysis. But for the for um, for this analysis to to look at an input output, it's a completely linear problem in this case. 
Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. And the second question is about your the, the boundary condition. I think the third, the third one, the third equation. So, yes. uh, uh, so can how how can you set the, the parameters of uh, in, in this equation for some real real yeah. plate? I mean, I mean, if we have different uh, geometries for the pole uh, side, mm -hmm. right? If you have different uh, poles or, or different size of the pole, so how can we determine the parameters in 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 this equation in the boundary equation? Yeah, great question. So so mm -hmm. the the good news is that alpha sub h is an open area fraction. So if you know um, if you've specified a geometry, say on a plate or an edge. So if I go back to here, we know the the whole size and spacing. We know the mm -hmm. percentage open area fraction here. That's something that's set by your design. If it's a textile, that's a bit more tricky to do, but that also can be backed out. Um, that's something you can you can again um, set by doing um, uh, either visual or a calculation uh, or some of the analysis to to measure this. The K sub bar sub R. This is what's called the relay connectivity um, for a circular hole without a flow. It's um, two times the radius mm -hmm. of the diameter, and so um, that's a known value. But if you have a background flow. Or if you have a different shape, mm -hmm. this value will change. And there's been okay. some work done by Michael Howe and and uh, Cheryl Grace and others who've shown again folks who are across the the pond. If you're uh, if you happen to be at MIT uh, at Boston University, that have have shown uh, how that can change as a function of flow speed as well as geometry. Uh, the epsilon here is again set by your structure. So if you have um, say a, a, a a paper edge or a plastic edge or a steel edge. Um, and you set the fluid as well. So it could be um, oil, air, or water. Um, the choice of the structure of, uh, of the solid and fluid set that value um, exactly. And so that is a fixed value for your analysis typically. Um, and the omega is your frequency parameter. So once you know pro properties of the solid, um, this is your coincidence frequency based on what's happening inside the structure. Um, this just becomes now your your acoustic frequency um, slider, right? So that's something you can kind of sweep through your analysis, and that shows you what how things will change as a function of frequency in your problem. So so epsilon alpha sub h in case of bar set by the problem setup, and your omega is something you can sweep through as as being um, uh, uh, something you set for your problem to investigate what's happening at different frequencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Minta, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, we cannot hear you, Minta. Sorry, sorry, we still cannot hear you. Oh, uh, you, you can just, oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, you feel free to just type if uh, the microphone doesn't work, so. So is there any other question? Uh, Okay, uh, so the question is, uh, can your code simulate the incoming flow? Yeah, so uh, in a case like this, this would be a computational fluid dynamic simulation or a comp computational air acoustic simulation where you have the flow and the acoustics done all at once. So the, the code is really, that I have is based off of uh, a math analysis. And so it's, it's taking essentially an input output situation. So you have, um, uh, a turbine eddy going in, and what is the amplification of, of the sound due to its interaction with the edge? So um, I don't, in my code, do any simulations on the left-hand side, but I've idealized the left-hand side as being this math problem where we're trying to find the noise of the observer due to a turbine eddy source close to the edge. And again, this, this turbine source is really just a point quadrupole that we specify. Yes, yeah, so no, no computational air acoustics here, but um, perhaps there's uh, 
there could be other other works that um, may may suit your needs if you're looking for that that problem. We could talk offline or you shoot me an email if you'd like to do so. Um, I could point you some references there. Okay, sounds good. So uh, we probably can uh, take another question. So is there any more question from the audience? This is your last chance to ask. Uh, sorry, I, I, Gisa Jali, is that, please, you can unmute yourself. Sorry for my pronunciation, so I- That's okay, yeah. that's absolutely fine. Um, okay. <laughs> hi, Dr. Jaworski, um, or it might be Professor Jaworski, I'm actually not sure. Um, I'm actually a PhD student of Inyatsu's, and um, he and I are looking at vortex gusts. I'm doing my PhD with um, a CDT in renewable energy, and I was wondering if you see an application for this kind of noise reduction device on something like a wind turbine or another kind of renewable energy device that uses wings. Yes, in, in the early days, certainly that has been where we saw the most direct application was for wind turbine blades. Um, because they operate at relatively fixed uh, operating point parametrically, and they're low speeds, and the main noise source for them is the trailing edge. Mm -hmm. and so the, the application there was really... Um, uh, from this is motivated by that, I should say. So if I go to the very end. So I mentioned in, in passing at, at the end, this is this is a treatment where we've actually developed um, this Finland technology with folks at um, at um, Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech and Fort Lankin University and Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. um, so these are placed right on the back edge of um, of an actual um, stationary wind turbine blade. And we, this is what we saw as the noise reduction here is 10 decibels. So this oh, is all still, yeah, so, and and these are, we see this as, as being possibly um, additive. So you can have this being an add-on to a wing as being a way to noise, produce noise, but you could also have things like serrations or other kind of um, um, the noise reduction technologies, either active or passive, that could work in concert with that. And so um, there is opportunity there to push that forward, certainly. Um, and um, yeah, we found that very exciting and promising that there's been this nice level of noise reduction um, observed experimentally. Usually you predict something and it gets a couple of decibels and decibels and you go to uh, practice and it's zero, right? Um, this way it was, we, we predicted a few decibels and it became 10 decibels in, rea in reality. It was completely backwards. So that's, that's, that's great when that happens. And that was the case here. Yeah, that looks really significant and it's actually i guess i would guess it's potentially really good news in terms of people objecting to wind turbine farms farms because of the noise pollution aspect sure well this has um and so for that that industry in particular it's um about um if there is that either real or or, or perceived um barrier right um if, yeah. you can, if it's, it's it's a competitive advantage to reduce that noise as much as you can to say i can sell Say more wind turbines in a certain area, be able to place more of them around areas that have noise ordinances, and so um, that certainly is an advantage in the marketplace to reduce noise, um, whether it's uh, a real noise reduction or not. But it still is competitive um, advantage there. Exactly. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. Thanks for this uh, very nice questions, and it seems there are a lot of interest in uh, this research. And later this week, we will send an email. Uh, is actually including the video, a link to the video and all the uh, relevant publication uh, like from this research. And uh, once again, please uh, join me and uh, thank, uh, thank, thanks uh, Professor Justin Jaworski to give this really nice talk. And uh, we will meet you again next week. Yes, thanks. Right. Well, See thank you, you, everyone. Yes, thank you.